So, you want to know what it means to repent and how. What does repent even mean? How does it even work? What, is, what do you do? Does it mean say sorry? A lot of times people are very confused about this subject. And condemnation and conviction, do yourself a favor and forgive yourself already. You might want to check that one out. I go into length of talking about that. But <clears throat> what does it mean to repent? What's the difference? How do we do it? Now, this is a fun subject because I've talked to many people about this and we've discussed and discussed and a lot of people have a different mindset. You know, the way I was raised, even at home, every time we did something wrong and we'd come home and, you know, we're either in trouble at school and we tell our mom or our dad, sorry, our parents is like, so what? You're admitting you're guilty? You, I need you to change. I don't want to hear sorry. I want to see a change in you. Because many times we think saying sorry to God, God, sorry, I'm a sinner. Sorry, God, I make mistakes. Sorry, God, I'm just, just the way you've made me. And we kind of think that way and we live that way. And that's why we have the same results. I'm like, you know why you struggle? Because you believe you have to. Do you know why you live in sin? Because you believe you have to. Do you know why you can live sin free? Because you believe God's word. And there is a way to walk with God that you do not have to struggle. You do not have to sin. Don't believe me? Why don't you just read Romans 8, read Romans 6. I'm sure that'll bless you. But anyway, I'm not going to go and tackle too many things today. I want to talk about repentance and how. If you want to look up repentance and even what the dictionary talks about it, Repentance means biblically. See, the world's version of repentance says, well, a sincere remorse, or you're really, I'm sorry, you feel sorry, you're sorrowful, okay? And then the Bible's version of it, it summons a person to absolute and ultimate unconditional surrender to God's life or God's sovereignty him being the ruler and living through you this includes sorrow and regret that's a part of it a godly sorrow we'll talk about that in a minute and in repenting one makes a complete change in direction a 180 degree turn towards God I've talked to some friends and we had a fun debate about this. Uh, one of them told me, well, okay, if you stole, you are a thief, right? You, you know, you're stealing. If you murder, then you're a murderer. And if you sin, you're a sinner. Come on, say it. You're a sinner. And I was like, wow, I, I couldn't say that. I couldn't say that because... God didn't save me to be a wretched sinner still. I have to say it this way. I was a sinner, but he came and he restored me to the original purpose, which was to be his son, just like Adam. So are you a sinner or are you a son? Are you sin conscious or son conscious? Which one are you? Now, I also had a, friend, a debate with one of my friend's dad. It was really fun. We were just sharing, and I need to share some Russian messages. <clears throat> because many times we, you know, anyway, I speak a little Russian, so I need to practice that. But uh, when I was speaking with him, he's like, well, Paul, I mean, we're, you know, we sin. That's just who we are. I was like, oh, is that who we are? I said, well, what about when it's time to go home? What happens to your sinful flesh? He's like, well, it falls off. It's in the grave. It's in the dirt. Well, then where does your spirit go? Well, my spirit goes to God. I said, so then who are you? Are you still your flesh? Or are you your spirit? And he's like, whoa. I was like, yeah. You see, we are eternal beings. You are not your weaknesses. You are not your faults. You are not your sins and all those things. You are a son of God. That is who the word says that you are. 
But if you choose not to believe it, and if you do not want to surrender your life, then live in a sinful, immoral lifestyle. Then yes, you are a sinner. You need to be a saint. Saint doesn't mean a holy, perfect person, and you've never made a mistake, and you never will, and, and, and it's like only the apostles, and we put our saints in stained glass, and we call them saints. The Bible calls us saints, those who are saved, sanctified, and called out of darkness into his kingdom of light. That is who you are. You are a child of God. He has made you holy. But some people say, yeah, but you know, when you sin, you got to feel sorry. You got to feel really bad, right? And that's how we're trained. And I guess I was taught religiously and, and I was trained to have sorrow and feel bad. So 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. Now, there's two kinds of sorrows, obviously. There's one that's godly, and there's one that's of this world. Now, here's the thing I found out, that the sorrow of this world, it's, it's totally different. It is such a grieving, there's such a sorrow that they said they captured a tear of someone whose loved one died, and they were sorrowing. They were just so, in so much sorrow that when they looked under the magnifying glass, they can see elements of death and decay in that sorrow. Because there's such a sorrow, and it leads a person to die. It, it's a grieving that kills you on the inside. And then there's a sorrow and a repentance that brings life. And if you analyze those sorrowful things, and you start checking it out, there's joy, and there's elements of life coming forth. Because you're changing, and it's a joyful changing of your heart and your mind. Now, I always felt I had to be feeling bad. And I spoke with a friend. I was like, well, he's like, yeah, you got to like, you know, beat yourself up about it. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, I used to do that, too. And, and how long do you beat yourself up with? How long do you keep yourself away from God? How long do you separate yourself from him? How long do you stop going to church? Me and my buddies, we used to serve God all the time back in the day when we were in our teenage years. And we would... Uh, you know, try to live righteously and go to church and do all the churchy stuff. And then when we felt bad and we sinned and we felt really guilty, then, you know, one guy feels bad, the next feel bad. And then we stop going to church. We stop praying. We stop seeking God because we're supposed to beat ourselves up and feel sorry. Well, the longer we feel sorry and the more we beat ourselves up, we just deprive God of that fellowship with us. And he wants to father you. And if you had a child and your child deprived you of teaching them and fathering them because they wanted to beat themselves up, you would look at them and say, why don't you spend time with me and I'd help you. And I would encourage you and teach you and correct you. Not run from me. Run to God. In your sorrow, in your midst, run to God, not from God. He has his hands open to you. He's not mad at you. He's not upset. He doesn't have a frown on his face. He has his hands wide open. And he's saying, son, come home, daughter, come home, it's time. He wants to throw a party with you. He wants to restore that relationship that you feel like you lost. There's a sorrow that works salvation, and there's one that works death. Which one are you living in? Which one are you applying to feel sorry for? I don't longer feel sorry and beat myself up anymore. I changed that from months to weeks to one week. <clears throat> and then eventually I said, you know what? I'm just going to whittle it down to like a minute, a second. Ooh, I feel bad. Ooh, okay, I'm bad. Okay, Father, thank you for making me a son, righteous and holy. Well, you can't do that. Why? Separate myself from God? Beat myself up? Walk away from God? Feel guilty? Feel ashamed? Walk in... And, and this one pastor was saying, you know, should we say sorry? He's all like, well, with everything that God's given you as a child of God, yeah, it's okay to say sorry, <laughs> you know, because he's equipped you and you just aren't believing it or walking away from it. But it's not the sorry that he's looking for. It's a changed life. But, you know, sometimes it's our belief system because we don't understand his word. And I wanted to ask you guys something or read something to you. <clears throat> when you don't feel righteous 
and you can't boldly approach God's throne. The Bible says, let us boldly approach the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Are you boldly running to God in the midst of your struggle? Or are you running from Him? Which one are you doing? The Bible tells us to run to Him, not from Him. It says boldly approach to find grace and mercy. Come on, we got to run and say, Lord, I need help. Father, I thank you. You didn't make me to be this way. I thank you for making me new in Christ. I thank you for setting me free from sin, from all of this. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. There's a way to pray that makes you more sun conscious and not sin conscious. But sometimes we don't feel righteous. We don't feel holy and pure. But 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Through Jesus Christ, you were made righteous. You were made pure, and you were made holy, set apart from this world. Peter tells us to be righteous and to be holy, for I am holy. He was quoting something out of Leviticus. But he tells us to be holy. God is holy. He has called us to be holy. He's called us to be just like him. Here's the most simple message preached by the thief on the cross. Some people ask me, well, how does the salvation message work? And what's the simplest form? Or how does it really like boil it down? I'm like, man, this guy sure has a reward. (laughs) I'm glad we saved his testimony. He didn't have time to go to church. He didn't have time to sow an offering. He didn't have time to take communion. He didn't have time to get water baptized. He didn't have time to receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. He didn't have time to read the Bible fast or nothing. I mean, he didn't have time to do anything. Here's how it goes. Luke chapter 23, 39 through 43. One of the criminals was hanged there, hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not Christ? Save yourself and us. But he responded, But the other thief on the cross responded and saying, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? That's what condemnation will do you. It'll kill you. And we are indeed suffering justly. You see, he knew we're getting the just punishment for our crimes, right? For we, we're, we're, Indeed, we are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said unto him, Truly I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. That is so beautiful. That is so the simple gospel. There is no confusion. There is no mincing words. There is just a man saying, I deserve this. I'm guilty to be separated from everything, to deserve to die. To I deserve this. And I know that you're Jesus. I know that you haven't done anything to deserve this acknowledges that he needs help, acknowledges that he deserves to die, acknowledges that he's worthy of judgment, acknowledges Jesus as Lord, and then say, hey, can you remember me? Don't forget me. And Jesus is like, that's all it takes. It's the simple gospel. That's all it takes. It's a man who believes in Jesus who sees that he needs a savior, repents, turns 180 degrees. It's too late. He can't do any Christian duty, but he changed his mind and his heart, and he acknowledged Jesus. And it says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Let's call upon him. Let's not live another day in things that we are struggling in. Let's not suffer another moment under a sentence of condemnation. The Bible says, 
in Isaiah 64, verse 6, that our righteousness was as filthy rags. But guess what? We have his righteousness. We are sons. So when you make sins and mistakes, if you're still addicted to smoking something or whatever, don't stop. Keep pursuing him. Keep speaking to him. This is how I would do it. Father, I thank you for setting me free from sin. I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for making me whole and new. I thank you that I am a son in your image. I thank you for setting me free from all unrighteousness. Father, I thank you that you have given me strength and that sin has no dominion over me. For I do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Father, I thank you for making me your child. I thank you for writing my name in the book of life. Thanks for loving me. Thank you for your blood that washes me and makes me white as snow. I thank you that I am attached to you. That there is no disconnect. There is no separation. And you have made me clean because of the word and the message that you have spoken. I have believed. I thank you for making me righteous. Thank you for making me pure. Thank you for making me a son. Thank you for setting me free from all sin, sickness, disease, poverty. Thank you, thank you, thank you for making me a son. Thanks for loving me, Father. Thanks for making me your friend. That's how I would pray. That's how I do pray. That's how I just talk to God in my heart throughout my days. That's what I encourage you to do. Not to struggle and fight and wrestle with just thoughts of unbelief, thoughts of doubt. Just give your heart to Him. Give your thoughts to Him. Give your mind to Him. He wants to do this with you. You do not have to do this alone. He doesn't expect you to sit here and go through life and struggle alone. He's giving you the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, come. I need you. I need your help. And then open up your mouth. There's words that will come out and start speaking them. The Holy Spirit wants to fill you and he wants to co-labor and live through you. He has so much he will bring. Yeah, I used to struggle. I used to have those same problems like everybody else on the planet. But guess what? I run to him, not from him anymore. He's a good father. He wants you to come home. Stop running and fighting against yourself. Forgive yourself. He's forgiven you. One time I was driving to see my friend. And my wife and I and my friend uh, was with me. And we were just talking uh, about, can you see visions even when your eyes are open? And I was like, well, sure. Okay, well, let's do that. Let's pray and Let's see if the Lord shows us anything. And and I felt like I saw an open vision. And, and I'm driving. My eyes are open. I'm behind the wheel. Yet I see Jesus right in front of me. Floating. And he's keeping up pace with my car. And I'm making all these turns. And he's just looking at me in my eyes. And he keeps saying, you are pure. You are pure. You are pure. And I'm crying. I'm like, God, I don't feel pure. I make mistakes. I've sinned that time and that time and that time. He's like, yeah, but you repented and your heart changed and you don't want to be that person anymore. Therefore, that's not who you are. You're my son. Yeah, but like, I'm probably going to make mistakes in the future and I'm probably going to do that. He's like, well, if you believe you will, then you will. But if you believe that you are my son and you believe my words about you, stop saying things about you that's not my word. I used to say negative things about me. And I used to say, well, it's true, you know, it's, it's facts. And we speak facts, but truth changes fact. The truth of God's words should change all the facts in your life. Fact, I didn't do too well in school. Truth, he has made me wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. He has made me so different. Because it's his word. 
and I'm going to believe his word over any lies you try to tell me, the world tries to tell me, or anyone else that doesn't line up with what he says. I will dismiss it like it's from the devil. I don't care. I only want to stand on his word and believe his truth, his words over me. I won't twist it for my benefit. I will spend time until he reveals it and makes it clear unto me. His word is given for you to understand, not for you not to understand. And you're not having a problem with the word of God because you don't understand it. It's the parts that you do understand and you're doing nothing with. That's what you have a problem with. There's too many verses we can wrestle to our own destruction. There's too many things that we think might contradict one another. But the stuff that you do understand and do nothing with, that's what's bothering you. That's where you need to change and say, Lord, I need help right here. I understand that. I don't get the rest of it. Maybe you'll help me. But right now, I understand this and I need help. He'll help you. You're not alone. There's people who are with you. There's people who are praying for you. And if you're here listening to this, I'm praying for you. So, Father, I just want to thank you for my friends watching, for brothers and sisters in Christ and those who aren't yet, those who are confused, they're lost. Father, touch their hearts right now. Open their minds to see and understand how to change, how to repent. Not just say sorry and do it again and sorry and do it again. Father, show them how to be sun conscious, to be sons in their heart. Show them how to have that godly sorrow, to repent and not have to repeat, to change their mind and to believe once and for all your word. Father, I thank you for giving them this wisdom, the faith to do everything you've called them to do. Father, I bless them right now in Jesus' name. And I thank you for opening their eyes to see and their ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to them right now. So Holy Spirit, speak so tender right now to them. Show them what they need to change, repent of. And you don't repent saying, sorry God, I sinned here and there. Man, if he's showing you like, hey, you shouldn't have said that. I usually try to go and make it right with the person. And say, hey, you know what, I said that, I shouldn't have. I don't know what I was thinking, I'm so sorry. But if I can't make it right with the person, I just do it in my heart and say, Father, I thank you for setting me free, making me new, making me whole. And I thank you for what Jesus did for me. That is not who I am anymore. That is not how I'll live. I thank you for making me your son and writing my name in the book of life. So that's how I would pray. That's what I would do. So I bless you. If you can make it right, do it. If you've taken something, Give it back if you can. I've done that. I used to have a little thing where I just like to take things that weren't mine. If I saw someone had something that I wanted, I'd go and take it. That's just human nature, right? But that's not the nature of Christ. I went back. I gave it back. I gave extra back. And I just said, hey, you know what? I just can't do this. I have to give this back. And they're like, wow, thanks. You know, we're compensated. We don't need this. And I said, yeah, I know, but I want to do it. And I want to share what God did in my life and how amazing he is. And I was a child, but I know I still need to repent. And if I can make it right, I will. And it does humble you. And it does kind of embarrass you. But you know what? I'm not living for my own life, for my own pride, and for my own glory, but only for his. And my flesh will learn to submit itself, to repent, and to trust God in all things. So I bless you, and hopefully this helps you understand what true repentance means, how to change 180, and to walk the other way. Make up your mind and your heart, and do it, and believe his word, and he'll help you. Ask him, because he'll help you. Thanks for redeeming the time, and we'll see you again.